It's the Great Commission, or it's one instance of the Great Commission. We find in Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, the Bible says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Now, Christ is speaking here specifically to disciples who are following him. But they are also the foundation of the church. That is coming. And so when he speaks to them, he's also speaking to the church. This is to be church doctrine. This is what we're to do. This is how a church functions. And, he, and he, after he said, all power is given unto me in heaven and earth, he says, go ye therefore. Because of I have all power, you can go forward. Go therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. So he tells us, we talked about this when I preached on the Great Commission, that we are to evangelize, we're to baptize, and then we're to stabilize. Those that are saved needs to be discipled. And so... The Bible says in 2 Peter 3.18, But grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen. The Bible tells us to grow in grace. 1 Peter 1.25 says, But the word of the Lord endureth forever. This is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2 Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. Now, the Bible talks about a, a process just like a baby. When a baby's a baby, we feed them milk and soft things, but then as they grow, we begin to give them things like bread and meat. And every Christian ought to be that way. You ought to be off the milk after a while and on the bread and meat. And you ought to want to do that on your own. We, you should be taught how to do that, but once you're taught how to do that, then you should be uh, self-sufficient. Amen? Now, I'm going to be turning these slides, and, and if you don't want to pay attention to them, that's all right. We want to look, first of all, did it turn? All right. We want to look, first of all, at what a disciple is. Um, David Cloud wrote in his book, one who receives instruction from another, an adherent to the doctrines of another. That's Webster's definition. Jesus Christ demands total devotion from those who will be his disciples. He gives us that in John 8, 31. Then, Jesus, then said Jesus unto the Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then are you my disciples indeed. Matthew eleven twenty eight through 30, I love this. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Amen? Disciple is a word most often used in the New Testament. Brother Kelly said that this morning. Um, for a believer and those who follow Christ. He told those disciples, those first 12, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So in discipleship, there is a goal for each disciple, and that's to win another person to Christ and disciple them. Now, in our efforts to do this, I want you to be able to win others to Christ. I want you to be able to disciple others for Christ. The goal of discipleship is to make disciples that will make disciples. 
And so that's reproduction. God tells us to reproduce all throughout the Bible. Not only do we reproduce physically, but we, we, we should be reproducing spiritually. And uh, so that, that ought to be our desire. Amen? Now, in your discipleship, I'm going to give you some things that you need um, that would help you. Amen? Number one, you need a good King James Bible. Uh, not anything else but the King James Bible. And I don't think anybody in here uses anything else, but if you do, you won't be able to follow. <laughs> you got to have a King James Bible. And so you should have a good King James Bible, good study Bible, Schofield Bible. I don't agree with everything Schofield says, but it's a good Bible, and you can use that. There's other study Bibles that you can use, but you do have to be careful. Amen. There are people who print what they call King James Bibles with changes in them. Amen? Uh, one of those is, is it Hendrix? Hendrickson? I think it's Hendrickson. There are words that are changed. And I had a, a new believer get one of those and brought it to me and said, look, you said this, but this says this. And, and it had words changed in it. I think Nelson's has some, some Bibles that they have changed the Word of God. So get a good, dependable King James Bible. Also, uh, if you get a Schofield Bible, you need the old Schofield Bible. The new Schofield Bible has words that has changed in it. So you have to even be careful. Aren't they sneaky devils? And uh, there are some places that I can tell you about. Church Publishers is one of them Amen. where you can get a good Bible that there's no words changed. And so if you don't have that, you need to get that. Amen? Now, um, I believe Brother the Church or Brother Kelly one, I don't remember who did it, but each family in the church got a copy of David Cloud's encyclopedia uh, of, of the Bible and Christianity. Who does not have one of these? Who does not have one? Brother Jimmy, Brother Mike, do you guys have one? Blakeman's? Who else? Oh, uh, the two checks. You guys have one, right? Okay. So Jimmy, Brother Mike, and the two checks. And I'm sorry, and J. Dina. All right, so we need about four or five. Okay. We'll, you don't have one, Brother Bill? Okay. They're, uh, I think if we buy them in bulk of five, we can get them for $35 a piece. Uh, and if you can't do that, just let us know, and we'll, we'll help you with that. Okay? Because this is an excellent tool. Very good. All right? Also, well, you can get a digital copy if that's the way you'd like to go. All right? which I'm in favor of. Then there is a Webster's 1828 uh, War and Peace. <laughs> this, this is an excellent dictionary. Words in the English language has changed, but the things that he says in here is, is more toward the intent of our English Bible, this Webster's 1828. I don't know how much those are. Do you have an idea? Anybody have an idea? I, I'm not sure how much they are, but you can get that digitally too. Um, and uh, so that's Webster's 1828 Dictionary. That will help you as you study words. Amen. What is the Bible? Words. Is it words? So it's good to study words. Amen. And so... You should do that. Then we have Strong's Concordance. And there are people who argue with that, but let's just not be silly. Uh, Strong's Concordance has been around a long time. It is a valuable tool. I'm not going to tell you it's perfect. Strong, James Strong was not perfect, but this is a great tool. And what this does, does, does anybody not know what a Strong's does? Takes the Greek and the Hebrew, gives you the words and the meaning of the word. So it's almost definitions of the word as you study it. Now, you don't have to have all those. You can take your Bible and study your Bible, but this is great help, okay? So if somebody needs help with those things and like to have them, if you'll just get with me, we'll make sure that you get those. But you should have all those things in your arsenal when you study the Bible. And we're going to ask you to study your Bible. Amen? Now, the next thing is, and guys, I'm going to need you again. At the end of this course, I would like to give you 
a diploma. It says you've been discipled. But to do that, i got to know that you've been discipled. So there's a little quiz at the, e at the end of each lesson. Amen. You don't have to do it, but if you would do it, it'd help me. Um, and then on the, you can use the back to answer the questions where there's not enough room. They're not terrible questions. They're all right in your book. So if you'll, it's an open book quiz. If you'll take that quiz and turn it back into me with your name on it. Um, the reason I'm doing this is because one day I'd like for you to be able to disciple somebody else. Okay? And I don't know unless you fill this out if you get it. Okay? So we want, we want to do that if you would. So guys, if you would pass one of these out to everybody. If you don't want to do it, you can throw it in the trash or whatever. But I would appreciate it. All right, so this is the discipleship class. This is where we're going to start. And today's start place will be on repentance. That's the first lesson in the book. And so we're going to look at that. Repentance. These are in the front of your book under the start. They're called memory verses. All right. We just started tonight, so if you would try to remember, these are easy verses, if you'd try to memorize those verses uh, as we go, and then when you fill out your quiz, right on there, memorize the verse. Says, there's not enough. Moses got some. Did you have enough? If you don't mind, on the bottom of the quiz, just put, memorize the verses. All right. Here's the verses right up here. Luke 13, 3. I tell you, nay, but except you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Who, who was saying that? Jesus Christ. So would you agree with me that Jesus Christ preached repentance? He did. Acts chapter 17, verse number 30. In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. To repent. It's something to do. Repentance. It's not works. We'll get to that in a minute. Acts chapter 20, verse 21. This is, this is a key verse right here. Acts chapter 20, verse 21. Testifying both to the Jew and also to the Greeks, repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay? Those are your memory verses. They're not hard. They're easy to be remembered. If you put those in your heart, if somebody challenges you about repentance, then, then you will have those verses in your heart. Amen? Now, Brother Cain is here from, from Boise, and he was telling me that uh, Stephen Anderson uh, has... Uh, started a church. One of his men has started a church in Boise, and uh, they do not believe in repentance at all. And uh, in fact, calls you stupid if you do. And uh, it's a bunch of nonsense. But uh, Stephen Anderson uh, does not believe in repentance, so you could be challenged on what you believe on repentance. All right. Now, while we're separating from error, which there's plenty of, I just mentioned one who is completely in error, not just on that, but about everything he says. Uh, while we're separating from error, sometimes it's necessary to have a division. Sometimes we just can't fellowship with certain people because their doctrine is wrong. Brother Kelly also covered that this morning. And so we, sometimes we just we have to have a division. But if we get straight on our doctrine and what we believe, sometimes silly divisions don't have to happen. Sometimes things can be worked out because the Bible says it. And so we can go to the Bible and find out what we do believe, and you should know what you believe. You shouldn't tell somebody, well, because my pastor preaches that, or because Brother Kelly teaches that. It should be something that's sealed in your heart. So this is going to take some work. Amen? It's a labor. And so you should be willing to do that, uh, is to work on this thing. Amen? Now, also... Uh, the Bible tells us to study, to show thyself approved unto God, 
a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, here's the key, rightly dividing the word of truth. Rightly dividing the word of truth. There are things that we'll be talking about during this study, which are principles of Bible interpretation, that you should, and Brother Kelly's been pounding this in your head for years, but the very first thing is context. You have to know what the writer's talking about in the context. Then, and here's where repentance comes in, you have to compare other scriptures with that scripture. Amen? Did you know the book of John does not mention the word repentance? Does that mean it's null and void? No. It, it may not mention it, but it's there. And so all the other verses mention repentance. Jesus Christ preached repentance. And so we have to compare other scripture with scripture. And so that, that's what we'll be doing during this time, but rightly dividing the word of truth. Amen? And our goal is to restore others to repentance, is either restore or bring them uh, to the knowledge that they need to repent. And it's just not preached much anymore. It's a, it's a shame uh, that people have such a low attitude of salvation that they don't add uh, that in there because it's necessary. Amen? Now, I'm going to read you something a little bit lengthy. Um, there is a Baptist historian named B.H. Carroll. How many have heard of him? Um, B.H. Carroll. This is what he said. The preacher that leaves out repentance commits a, 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 as grave a sin as one that leaves out faith. I mean, he must preach repentance just as often uh, and with as much emphasis and to as many people uh, as he preaches faith. To omit repentance, to ignore it, to depreciate it is rebellion and treason. That's pretty hard words, is it not? But he's right. We can't leave it out. Uh, there's been a lot of people, and I don't know if Brother Kane has experienced that. I'm sure he has being in the ministry. We have a lot of people that believe because they repeated some prayer after somebody uh, that they're saved, and that's not salvation. Salvation, Jesus told Nicodemus. And you know, he only had a few minutes with Nicodemus, but he told him, he said, you must be born again. And so it's a new birth. It's a birth. It's not something that you just repeat after me. And so repentance is very necessary. So in these first few lessons, we'll, uh, we'll learn man's part uh, in salvation. Now, I'm not saying that we save ourselves or we have works that save ourselves. You'll find out, that out. But there is something that you have to do. Amen? And that is to repent and have faith in Christ. You must turn to God and you must have faith in Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says, repentance toward God and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so repentance and faith is on your side. God has done everything else. He sent His only begotten Son to die for us. He is the mediator, no one else. We don't bring our good works to Him, but we must turn to God. Amen? And I've been preaching a lot on that lately, and I believe that's to be true. Amen? And Paul describes both of these in, in Acts chapter 20, verse number 21. Um, and, and he puts repentance first, and that's where it should be, and then faith. You can't have faith in Christ until you turn to God. Amen. Change your mind. That changes your actions. Um, and I'm afraid the church has learned to uh, have a drive-in type of doctrine where everything's easy, and, uh, and so we ought to do everything easy to get a big crowd. And, uh, and Brother Cain, we're not going to preach in the way we do. We're not going to get a great big crowd. Amen? But we're going to be telling people the truth. And I'd rather stand before Christ telling people the truth than I would have a great big crowd. My, my pastor says it this way. I can run over a dog on the way to work, and when I come back, it'll be bigger. That, that don't mean it's alive. It means it's full of putrid things. And so this emerging church and all this stuff that's going on is false. And so we need to stick to the truth, amen? And be glad that we have a church that wants the truth, amen? And so uh, they have made things uh, harder. Did you know that God don't think like we do? Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And so God 
doesn't think like we think. Now, I want to give you an example, and I'm going to be giving others. But you remember the story of Jonah? Jonah was given the task of going to Nineveh, which were the terrorists, the, the um, Hezbollah, the, the, uh, you know, the ISIS of, of the day. They killed uh, Hebrews. They hated them. But he was given that task to go there and tell them to repent. And this is what he did. In Jonah chapter 3, verses 4 through 10, Jonah began to enter into the city a day's journey, and he cried and said, Yet forty days, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. So the people of Nineveh believed God. They believed God and proclaimed a fast and put on sackcloth at, uh, from the greatest of them even to the least of them. For word came unto the king of Nineveh, and he arose from his throne and laid his robe from him. There you find humility. There you find the uh, surrender of the will, uh, the yielding of the will. Amen? And covered him with sackcloth and sat in ashes, and he caused it to be proclaimed and published throughout Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, saying, let neither man nor beast, herd nor flock, taste anything. Let them not feed nor drink water. But let man and beast be covered with sackcloth and cry mightily unto God. Yea, let them turn everyone from his evil way and from the violence that is in their hand. Who can tell if God will turn and repent and turn away from his fierce anger and we perish not. And God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. Now listen to this. God repented of the evil and he, that he had said that he would do unto them, and he did it not. Now, when it says God repented, he changed his mind about Nineveh. He changed his mind that caused an action. He, he forbear what was coming to them which they deserved. Amen? And that's what happens to you and I when we repent. We change our mind about God and come to, to Christ and trust Him by faith. We don't have to go to hell now. He forbear our judgment. That's what God did. Did you know the Bible gives us several examples when God said He repented, changed His mind, and forbear their judgment? Genesis chapter 6, the Bible says it repented the Lord that He had made uh, man on the earth. The Bible says he found grace. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And uh, when he changed his mind, he, he saved Noah and those eight that got on the ark, and the world was saved. The Bible tells us in Exodus chapter 32, uh, having to deal with Moses. Uh, Moses begged God to turn, uh, uh, re that to repent or change his mind about the, um, the uh, judgment that was coming. He said, repent, repent of this evil uh, against thy people. And the Lord repented of the evil which he thought to do unto his people. He changed his mind that had a change of action. Amen? Second Peter chapter 3, verse 9, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but his longsuffering to us were not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Repentance is all throughout the Bible. It's not a work. It's something that happens that gets you to God so that you can faith, uh, put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Now, follow, there's some things that are following here that um, are answers to some important questions about repentance, and we're going to look at those things. Uh, is repentance necessary for salvation? Um, Repentance is commanded by God. Jesus Christ said you had to repent. Uh, it is mentioned 60 times in the New Testament. It was preached by John the Baptist. It was preached by Christ. It was preached by Peter. It was preached by Paul. Both repentance and faith are required for salvation, and the Apostle Paul preached both. And I've said this, and this, is, this is, may seem like a silly statement, but how can you come to God unless you turn and come to God? You can't be facing uh, the wrong way 
and come to God. One old preacher said, you can't go to heaven walking toward hell. You have to turn. You have to repent and turn and come to God. Amen? Now, let's look at some things uh, that we have here. And uh, I tried to make it colorful so you could pay attention. Uh, I may be behind right here. Yep. All right, here we go. What are some false views of repentance? Brother Cloud is good to cover these things. It's in your book. And then he has, if you'll go to Way of Life um, on the Internet, you can go to Way of Life, and he has a lot of things on, on repentance that you can look up, uh, extra, extra things. Uh, what are some false views of repentance? Number one, repentance is not reformation or changing one's life. It's not flipping over a new leaf. Uh, I met a man one time and I asked him, if, had he ever been saved? And uh, he said, well, I quit drinking and smoking. And that, that's not repentance. Repentance is turning to God. He takes away all that after salvation. But the Bible says we're saved on two good works. The works is not what saves us. You have to turn to God and trust the mediator that he sent in his son, Jesus Christ. And so repentance is not reformation. It's not turning over a new leaf. That's human works. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained, that we should walk in them. Number two, repentance is not doing penance. It's not doing penance. It's not doing things to get you favor with God. I'm making sure I've got the right one. In the Philippines, when we went there, we, we got to go there and preach a revival for 10 days. And while we were there, it was the week that the, Philippine, the Filipinos uh, they do all this penance stuff. They, they walk down the street and whip their backs till it bleeds. They walk up steps on their knees and till it bleeds. And then they try to hang themselves on crosses. None of them can stay more than two or three minutes, but they try to, they actually pierce their hands and hang them on crosses for milliseconds. They can't stay up there any longer than that. And, uh, and none of that gets you to heaven, friend. Penance. The Catholic Church came up with that term. Penance. They took repentance and changed it to penance. Do. You work. Uh, and if you work, God will recognize your work, and that will get you to heaven. But repentance is not penance. That word uh, penance means do penance. Um, and, and, uh, and so you confess to a, a, a priest, and uh, he'll forgive you of your sins. And that's not what the Bible says, that a man can forgive. I can't forgive you of your sins. I can go sit in that middle closet right there and, and interview every one of you and can't forgive one sin. But Jesus Christ can. I can point you to the one that can. We have a high priest in heaven who can do that. And so repentance is not uh, doing penance. Uh, number three, repentance is not mere remorse for something that you did. It's not mere, merely being sorry for your sin. Uh, the Bible tells us in uh, 2 Corinthians seven ten, For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrow of the world worketh death. You can be sorry for your sin, but not repentant. You can be sorry that you got caught, but not repentant. Now, there's, there's two people, one in the Old Testament, one in the New Testament, that gives us this picture. Number one is King Saul. Remember when King Saul got caught? In fact, he tried to blame everybody else for it. He got caught, but he did not repent. He did not change. King Saul lost his life over that. He never repented. He never changed his mind and turned to God. And then we have a, a picture in Judas. I'm going to tell you something. Judas was not saved. Never was saved, although he had the opportunity. He could have repented. He could have changed his mind about those things that changed, and then come to Christ and trust him. But he never did. There's an old sermon that he got close enough to kiss the door to heaven and yet never repented. And uh, he never, never trusted Christ as his Savior. So we have those pictures of that. It's not just merely being sorry. Amen. It does include sorrow, 
but it's godly sorrow. It's sorry that you sinned against an, a holy God and, uh, and sorry you're, you agree with God against yourself that you're guilty. Repentance is not merely believing in Christ. It's not merely believing in Christ. Did you know the Bible tells us that the devils believe and tremble? They, the devils, they know <laughs> that, that Christ is the one that came and died on the cross. And they believe that, but they're not saved. Why? No repentance, no turning to God, no, no uh, uh, asking forgiveness or, or uh, uh, trusting Christ by faith. Uh, the devils don't do that. So it's not just ser uh, merely um, believing in Christ. Amen? And, and, and then listen to this. Repentance, uh, this doesn't mean rep repentance is merely good works. It's not good works. But it's a change of mind that changes your actions or your life. It will change your life. Listen to me. If, if what happened in your, in your experience of being saved did not change your life, you're not saved. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. And it's an amazing thing to me that everybody in the Bible that truly came to Christ, he changed their life. He changed Paul's life drastically. Paul had it made. I mean, he had his career made, and he, he changed it. When the Lord saved him, he changed his life. Paul was on the road to Damascus with papers under his arm to take Christians and put them in prison and ultimately kill them. And whatever happened to him on the road to Damascus, did it change his mind? Did it change his actions? He went to Damascus, but he didn't go there to kill Christians. He went there to join in with them. Now that's God. God showed him his sin. God showed him his end. God showed him that all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And Paul had a change of mind that changed his heart. Now, he went the same direction walking, but he went a different way spiritually. Amen? That's what happened to me. That's what happened to me. I had no desire. I had no, de no desire to join in with these Christians. I didn't want to be around them, didn't like preachers, didn't like church folk. But when, when I repented, I, I changed my mind about those things. Matthew chapter 21, I want you to listen to this. Look in verse, you don't have to turn there, but Matthew 21 verse 28. But what thank you, a certain man had two sons. He came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. And afterward, he repented and he went. He had a change of mind that changed his actions. What if he'd said, uh, well, I've changed my mind, but he didn't go. That's not repentance. He's not walking toward what's right. His actions didn't change. The next son, the Bible says, and he came the second and said, likewise. He answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. No repentance there. No no, no. Uh, Doing the will of God. Listen to me. It's a change. It's a drastic change in the will of man is to repent. Now, what is biblical repentance? Is that up there? Number one, repentance is admitting that I have sinned against God and being sorry for that. We call that conviction. Convinced. That's, that's a word we use today, convinced. But God convinces you that you're a sinner. That's why we preach the Word of God. That's what the Word of God and the Holy Spirit does is it reproves us of sin. The Holy Spirit takes the Word of God and puts that into our life and shows us that we're sinners. And what, who we've sinned against is a holy God. <laughs> You can murder a man and the sin that you've committed is against God. You can tell a lie and the sin that you've committed is against God, a holy God, a righteous God. 
And, and, and listen, convent, uh, conviction convinces you of that. And that's the beginning of changing your mind and turning toward God. He lets you know who you are. He lets you know where you are and where you're going. Amen. You know, this Bible's full of telling us that there's a hell and it's real. And those that die without Christ go there eternally. Amen. And so it's, uh, it's, it is a sorrow. We're sorry that we've sinned against God. We're not sorry because we got caught. We're sorry because we have actually sinned against God. Somebody that's under conviction will admit to you and share with you that they know they have sinned against God. I read a story one time about a fellow who, who had, uh, he was living in adultery and uh, he, he actually went to a preacher and said, is that wrong? And the preacher read him the scriptures how that was sin. And the man fell out on his face and he said, I'm, all, I'm in trouble with God. I'm in trouble with God. What can I do? What can I do? He can turn to God. Amen. He can re repentance is toward God and faith toward Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Repentance is toward God. Repentance is admitting that I'm wrong and God is right. The Bible is right. The Holy Spirit is right. And I'm wrong. Number two, repentance means to turn around, to change directions. Amen. It's a change of mind that changes the heart and the actions of a person. Amen. When I got saved, I knew nothing, not one thing. I mean, my wife had drugged me to church at times. I didn't want to go, didn't like it. If I could get out of it, I would. And I'm ashamed to say this, but I was mean to her. When she got me to go, I was mean to her so she wouldn't ask me to go again. I didn't like what they said. Every time they preached, they was talking about me, and I didn't like it. But the day that I got saved, I got up from that place, changed. I even called my wife and said, I'm not sure exactly what all happened to me, but I got saved. And the day that I got saved, I didn't become perfect. I still, I still have my issues, amen. But I was a changed man. I loved the church. I wanted to go. I told my wife, I said, I'm not sure what all happened to me, but we're going to church on Sunday. She never heard that out of my mouth ever. I'm going to church Sunday. I went to church. I told everybody at church I got saved. I, I, I wanted to talk to the preacher. He took me in his office. He gave me a Bible. I wanted to read the Word of God. I didn't read a book my whole life. Amen? I, I found subjects that I knew there were movies about, and I'd watch the movie and do the test on the movie. I didn't realize that movies are far off from the book at that time, but I didn't like to read. Amen? But God put a change in my life that caused me to love the Word of God. I love the Bible. There's a change there. Amen? All right. Repentance means? Where am I at? Is anything changing? Huh. Well, there you go. Here we are. Sorry about the delay. Repentance means to surrender to God's rule. And we're not talking about lordship salvation, but he will become the Lord of your life. He's the one you want to please. Amen? You, you all of a sudden become interested in what God is interested in. You all of a sudden become interested in Jesus Christ because he's the one that saved you. Amen? He's the one you now love. Repentance is to receive Christ as Lord. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 13 tells us that. Uh, to believe is, uh, is to receive Jesus Christ as my Savior. Not repeating some prayer. Amen? But it's, a, it's to receive Jesus Christ as your Savior. He has offered you a free gift. That gift is the forgiveness of your sins through what we call the gospel, what the Bible calls the gospel. He died for our sins according to the Scripture. He was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. That's the gospel. 
You have to believe that. You have to trust that and receive that for yourself. The gift was given to you. You must receive it. My wife couldn't receive that for me if she would have done it years before I actually got saved. But I had to receive it for myself. Now, I, I, I guess for some people, I didn't do it proper. I wasn't in the church. But I was down on my face begging God to save me. And he did. Amen. Amen. And I received that salvation for myself. Now, repentance is not a changed life. It is a changed mind about God and sin that results in a changed life. Amen? I can put on a, a lost man can put on a suit and come to church. But that doesn't mean he's been saved. Amen? And that's not repentance. Repentance means you have turned to God and you have put your faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. Amen? Now, if a person prays a prayer, a sinner's prayer, which is found nowhere in the Bible, but if he prays a sinner's prayer, it doesn't change his life. He has no desire for God, has no desire for the things that Christ has done for him, has no desire for the Bible, has no desire for church. If you have to beg somebody to come to church, there's something seriously wrong in that person's life. There, there, there's something wrong there. Amen? Now, I'm not saying that a, a, a saved person can get out of the will of God. They can, but they won't stay there because God, because God is a jealous God, and he'll come after them. And they're his children, and he knows how to take care of that. Amen? And so, uh, listen, if, if you never had a change that caused you to love those things and to want to do those things and want to and wanna be pleasing to God, something's wrong. Amen? It'll change your life. I've, I know people. Uh, Mel Trotter, who's heard that story? Mel Trotter. That's a wonderful story. Have y'all heard it? Uh, this, this man was a drunkard, a bad drunkard. And uh, one night his little girl was sick. His wife gave him enough money to go buy her some medicine. And he went to the beer joint and got drunk. And she died. And while he was over the casket, he took her shoes off out of the casket. Went back to the bar and laid them on the bar and said, how much can I get for those? Well, that's how bad Mel Trotter was. He got drunk that night and he stumbled into a mission and got gloriously born again and became a preacher of the gospel. A good one. Amen? That's a change. That's a complete change in a person's life. Amen? Drunkard to a preacher. I can tell you story after story after story of men who were that way, but God changed their life. And listen, you don't have to be a drunkard or, or in, in, uh, in some great big uh, moral sin. You can just not be saved. And you're going to the same hell that everyone else does. You must be born again, is what Jesus said. Now, there's some Bible examples of repentance. How about the prodigal son? The Bible says he came to himself. This, talk, this is talking about conviction. And after he came to himself, he said, I'm going to go back to the Father. That's repentance. Got back to the Father. He said, I'll just be a servant in your house. Amen. And was, was put in favor with the Father. Zacchaeus repented and uh, was so converted that he uh, tried to make right everybody he had ever done wrong. Uh, what a story. Then the Thessalonians turned to God from idols. Brother Cloud says this, which is important. A lot of people say it the other way around. They turn from idols to God. But that's not what it says. It says he turned to God, and that is important. The order of that is important. He, when you turn to God, your back is, is, is facing uh, what you were. And so there has to be a different direction uh, that is taken. Amen? Unless a person rejects his false gods and his false religion and surrenders to Christ's lordship, he cannot be saved. All right, next. The Bible warns that it's impossible, uh, that it is possible to profess Christ without possessing Christ. Now, uh, there's some scripture that deal with this 
Number one is Titus 1.16. They profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abom abominable and disobedient and under every good work reprobate. And what that's saying is if there's no change, there's no repentance, there's no change, you'll just keep doing the same things you were doing. You're still walking the same direction, and it's not real. And I'm not, listen, I've never been one that tries to make people make a second uh, a profession, but I am one that preaches the gospel and, and lets you know that it's real, and this is not a game. We're not playing a game here. This is talking about people's lives. This is talking about people's, people's soul. And so you must be sure that you're saved. 1 John 2, 4 he that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. The Bible gives us an example in Matthew chapter 7, verses 22 and 23. Many, many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, I have, not, uh, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that worketh iniquity. It's not enough to just believe. The devils believe and tremble. We talked about that. But you must come to God and trust him his way. Amen? And which is Jesus Christ, nothing else. Amen. The Bible talks about, and, and, and Brother Cloud gives this example in John chapter 2, verses 23 through 25. He talks about how that many said they believed but they'd never committed themselves to him. And he didn't commit himself to them. Amen? There must be a commitment. Amen? Now, how many of you ladies would, would uh, stay married to a man who says he loves you and he's your husband and he's never there? Never comes home, sleeps at somebody else's house. Now, that wouldn't be good, would it? And so, if we have committed ourselves to Christ, we should be Christ's. We should be His. Amen? I'm going to say this. I believe God, uh, through the Holy Spirit, after you get saved and you commit yourself to Him, He is committed to you. He'll tell you where, where to work. He'll tell you about your spouse. He'll tell you about what church to go to. I believe that with all my heart. I believe my whole life, can be orchestrated. The Bible says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And so if we believe that, then, then we're committed to Christ. Amen? And so uh, there, there's warnings there about false professions. Repentance is the missing element in the church. I believe that a lot. I believe there's a lot of folks that have been dealt a lie and are deceived and have never really come to Christ, and it's evident by their life. Uh, you you got to get a search warrant to find somebody that's a member of your church. Something ain't right. Amen? I've asked old preachers, Brother Cain, I've asked through time, what's the hardest thing you've dealt with uh, in pastoring the church? You know, what you know what they all say? Faithfulness. Why is it hard to be faithful if there's something that's not real in your life? You won't be faithful to that. If, if Christ is real in your life and you've been saved, that's not to say we don't uh, sometimes uh, do things we shouldn't do. But there'll, there'll be some sort of realness in there, and that realness will always, Christ will always bring you back in that relationship. Now, Brother, Ke Brother Cloud gives you a testimony in here and how he was young and he made a profession and he never really changed and all that's there. If you read his story, you'll find out he got saved later. A uh, Pentecostal preacher picked him up hitchhiking, and he got saved and, and, uh, and, and all that. So he, he, uh, he's not Pentecostal, but a Pentecostal man led me to the Lord. And uh, so I believe he loves the Lord with all of his life, uh, heart. I couldn't go with him after that, but uh, at salvation, he preached the gospel to me and told me the truth. And so, uh, so, so he gives that account. I won't give you a, a, another account of that. My wife was raised in church, and she'll give you this testimony in time you'd like to. But when she was a young lady, a, a, a little girl, she uh, followed some kids in vacation Bible school and repeated a prayer. There never was a change in her life. She, 
She didn't change. But when she was 18 years old, she heard the gospel preached. God got a hold of her heart and showed her how lost she was. And she came, she came to God, repented and came to God and trusted Him as her Savior. Amen? You can have a false profession. Now, you're the one that needs to find out if that's so or not. Did He change your life? Did He change your actions when you came to Him? Amen? And so, I believe uh, that's the missing element in the church is people not preaching repentance like it ought to be preached. And so it needs to be there. Amen. And uh, we're going to preach it here. That's, that's all there is to it. We're going to preach repentance here. Uh, then the last thing is, uh, this thing ain't working like I want it to. Salvation is a personal relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Not just something you hear about. Or when somebody stands up and say, I love the Lord with all my heart, he helps me, he's got me through things, he's helped me in the night, and you're sitting there wondering, what are they talking about? You know, I, I said this prayer, but I don't have a personal relationship with the Lord. I'm going to tell you something, when you have a personal relationship with the Lord, when you read the Bible, he speaks to you in it. He actually speaks to you, not out loud, but he speaks to you through the Word of God and the Holy Spirit. When you have a relationship with the Lord, He hears your prayers. He hears your prayers, and you can journal answered prayers that God has answered through your life. Amen? And so you can see those things in your life happening. It's a personal relationship with the Lord. And I know we have wore this out and wore this out and wore this out, but thank God it's here, 1 John 1, 9. That is repentance to the believer. That is, a, that is a turning. You cannot possibly, as a lost man, confess your sins. You, you couldn't list those if you, if you had years. You couldn't list all your sins. How many sins have you committed since you were born? <laughs> Do you know the answer to that? No. Especially when you were in the dark and didn't even know some of those things. And so you can't list those. But the Christian, thank God, the Christian has an avenue after we're saved. This has nothing to do with being saved. This has something with felt to do with fellowship. Our fellowship is because we have a relationship. Amen? And our fellowship gets broken when we sin. Willingly sin. Now listen to this. You remember when Peter denied the Lord? Y'all remember that? Three times he denied the Lord. Peter, uh, even at the, uh, when, when he was there, the Bible says he was using bad language and he, he denied the Lord. Well, Jesus came out of the trial. The Bible says he didn't say anything to him, but he just looked at him. Fellowship was broke. And the Bible says Peter went out and wept bitterly. Now, did he repent right there? No. He went fishing. But God convicted his heart and showed him, you've got some things that are wrong that's breaking our fellowship, and we can't even talk. You can't pray when you're wrong with God. The only prayer you can pray is 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful, us, say people, he is faithful, amen? Let's read it together. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Thank God there's a place for the Christian to come and restore their fellowship. Amen? Amen. Have you ever made your spouse mad? Don't lie. You ever made your spouse mad? You ever upset her, guys? You ever upset her? Did you have to get married again? You just had to come with a bunch of roses or something and say, I'm sorry, right? And all fellowship is restored, amen? She, she lays a big old kiss on you, and things are well, amen? She lays one of them kisses on you that sounds like a cow pulling his hoof out of mud. 
Amen. <laughs> Maybe she needs to get forgiveness. Amen. We, we confess our sins. God is faithful to do that. Amen. And we have a place of repentance. Billy Mitchell, old preacher, said this. He said, I know I repented when I got saved because I've been repenting ever since then. And I try to keep good, clean accounts with God. Amen. We're going to be dealing with some things as we go through this discipleship. One of those things is our conduct, our conduct, our conduct before other people, our conduct, how we are out in the open, how we represent God. And we ought to be people that are known as people who are in fellowship with God, that can get a hold of God, that live in such a way that they respect God and they live for Him. Amen? Your pastor should be that way and the church should be that way. Sometimes the church expects more out of the pastor than they do themselves. And the fact of the matter is, I am called to a place where, where there is an accountability higher and people are looking at me more, but they're looking at you too. And when you misrepresent God, you're misrepresenting Him and the church. And if you have, you need to confess that and get it right. Amen? I hope tonight, repentance is one of those things you've never feel, it's like grace. You never feel like you can really explain it right. But I believe that covers what repentance is for the most part. Is there more to it? There's all kinds of things we can look at. But for tonight and for this time, I think that covers what we're to do. Now next week we'll be covering faith, putting our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. And, uh, and then faith beyond Jesus, uh, beyond salvation, we have faith uh, that God will and can do all things. And so we'll be looking at that next week. Please fill out the review thing there at the end and turn it back in to me. And then uh, memorize the verses and keep those in your heart. It takes work. Girls, it's going to take some work. Bible studying, looking. Take your Bible and open it and look. So let's do that. Amen. Let's do it together. As I teach this, I'm going to be learning some new things myself. A new places, not new doctrinally, but new um, places to look and things to look at as far as it goes in that. Amen? Anybody